doesn't touch this issue in front of us. That doesn't touch this crime committed. This doesn't make this non-criminal. Maybe some other one did a crime. Let's deal with that one. But don't make that one knock this one out. So all we need to do is find a bunch of tricks. Those who speak the truth in front of the courts are threatened with death or even suffering. The witness protection program has to be set up to, prote to protect the truth-telling witness. Amen. Friends, th this is practical stuff now. This is some, God wants to see in a nation, in a society, truth having its way because that's the only way the society will survive. God does want men and women to be so weak and so degenerate there is no hope for us if we cannot hope that truth will win against evil. We cannot hope. We become hopeless. We give up. The witness protection plan has to be set up to protect the truth telling witness so that the truth telling witness does not decide not to show. Many cases have been lost. The prosecution has the case well in hand. The witnesses have been established. The day when the court is called, call witness, ABC, 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 ABC. My Lord, there's no witness. Case finished. The facts are there, the truth is there, but the witness has been frightened, terrorized. As you say, yes, or wasted away. It is amazing, amazing how much God deals with the courts in the book of Amos. You and I can be assured that God Almighty shudders at some of the transactions, some transactions of our courts. When a mere technicality sends a guilty crim criminal free on the road. When repeated murder suspects are let out on bail and murder while they're out. And there's no great, there's no great upheaval. I mean, I've never heard a judge say, I am sorry I gave the man bail. I've never heard it. And yet that's the cause why the man was able to murder. The judge gave him the privilege to murder by sending him on the road. They go out and threaten and terrorize. God is also troubled by the recent ruling of our Privy Council. Now friends, I know there's a big debate, but it is extremely clear to those of us who give God's word full authority. The first, the first established basis for righteously handling murder Murder, real murder. Someone convicted truly of murder. The divine directive at the very beginning of the social order after Noah came out of the ark when God reestablished the social rules of life. Up to this time, it was not in force. God handled Cain himself. God punished Cain personally. After the flood and Noah's day began, God gave up that rule and turned over the punishment of murderers like Cain to human society. Here is what God declared when he set up 
social life after the great flood when everybody perished because of sin and only Noah's family was saved. And from Noah came this whole new world of men and women, Noah and his sons. He said to Noah, here is how you will handle the social misfit who tries to, or who does, shed man's blood. Here is how God put it. Noah, the blood shedder will have his blood shed by his fellow humans. Whoso shed man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. Bible. That is not state murder. Nonsense. This do-good generation who talks about when the state takes a life it, it, in compliance with the murdering crowd is absolute nonsense. Foolishness. Everybody in this new thought pattern sees only one person in the ordeal. They only see the murderer. The victim is lost in the discussion. We can't do this to him. Listen to this. Listen to this. The Privy Council ruled that because a condemned murderer was on death row for five years, that that constituted cruel and unjust punishment. Therefore, that poor wretch should be freed from the crime. His life should not be taken. You Bahamian people took too long to cut off his head. So since you took so long to hang him up, it's unfair now to hang him now. You took too long. But look at the problem. The reason we took long was these court systems required so many appeals and they delayed it as best as they could to make sure it won't come up in a favorable time limit. And lawyers compliant and judges compliant and all working together that the appeal system is long because the more money they get out of the cases. And by the time it does show up, now the ruling is, you had him hanging around. Too long, you should have hung him and not hung him around. <laughs> Friends, we are going mad. Now here's what we must do. Here's what we must do now. Since we have sinned against this wretch so terribly, we now have a sentence passed on us. What is the sentence? We must preserve his life from now until the end. Make sure he has medical attention. Make sure he has three meals every day. And don't ever report any kind of abuse. The overseers handle him gently. Police never touch him. That's your punishment for not hanging him before five years. Now, if you rushed to, if you rushed to a hanging, the word would have been, the process of justice has not run its course. Now, the word of God is clear, brothers and sisters. It is clear. When God set up civilization after the Noah period, he made it clear that he was looking to 
humans on earth to defend two humans. One, to defend the worth of the one whose life was taken. Don't let that life fall without value. But the only value worthwhile to make that fallen life meaningful is for the one who took that life, he must forfeit his own. Now it's left to the people, to the brothers and sisters in the community who value both. We value the murderer to the extent that we cannot let you go untouched. We value you too much. You, you, you're worth too much for us to just let it slide. We've got to deal with you. You are one of us. You're a human. You're a man. You're in the image of God. We cannot treat you like animal. And the fallen one, we must defend your right to live, but you've lost it. Now, it's interesting that in that same text, it says, God requires the life of an animal as well. If an animal killed a human being, now most of the time, that's carried out without any worry. Now listen to me. Most of the time, the dog is shot. The donkey is shot. The lion is shot. The horse is shot. Most of the time, when they cause the death, but now when it comes to the human, they don't want to carry that side out. Now they say it's vengeance. Time is running out of just They say it's vengeance. They say it's vengeance to require that the murderer forfeit his life the way he took the life of the one who died. And vengeance is emotional. It's not rational. Don't be sensational. Well, let's look at that. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Now, nowhere does God say vengeance is wrong. Read it. God says it's mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Which means God is an avenger. Come folks, come folks. But here is what God said in the book of Romans. In Romans 12, he says, don't you take vengeance in your hand. You, don't you take vengeance in your hand. Because vengeance is in... Now, you'll follow me now. Follow me clearly. Don't you take vengeance in your hand. Because vengeance is in my hand. And under my rule, I have made the ministers of government my vengeance agents. Romans 18. Romans 13, the agent of government is set up by God to execute God's vengeance. You seem to be asleep. How does God carry out his vengeance in the case of this type of, through the agent, through the human agent, he has selected for that purpose. And that purpose is government, civil state, civil authority. God has transferred, not to the church, the church does not have authority to seek the vengeance, not us. He's transferred that to another category of rulers in the earth, whom we call the civil government, civil rulers. Now God has made them his agent of vengeance. That's why Paul says in Romans 13, look, don't fool, don't play with these people because they don't carry the, the sword for fun. They, they don't carry around the sword for fun. That sword is sharp, 
to be used. That's not merely a kind of showpiece. Now that's God speaking. However, we are now making the sword a showpiece. Listen to what Paul says. You should, be, you should be afraid of God's agent of vengeance. He should, bring, he should bring fear into being because you know when you get out of line, you are in serious trouble. God has turned over the execution of the vengeance of murder to human civil authority to execute it in his name. When it is not done, civil authority is saying to God, I disobey you. I don't honor you. And you could imagine the results that will bring. I'm saying to you, Amos holds up the court system very heavily in the nation. We can't have a sensible national life without a just court system. Are we ready, folks? Are we here? God says, he looks at the courts. He sees the carrying on. He wants justice to rule. Now, what can we do since we're on this vein and I'll close here? We are not generally up to date on what our country is, is about. We, we, we leave that to them. No man, learn your country. This is yours. Know what, what privileges, what responsibilities you have. Know what you could say about an issue that's happening around you. We certainly have to rise up and say, what's happening in the courts can't go on. We, 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 Can you live with that? In a way, you know, in a way, they are getting preferential treatment. You don't hear that about the robbers. Huh? No one is working hard. <laughs> they are dodging this issue that God has required the value of a human life. Now, for those of you who Maybe new to this. Just let me go back again to, to Genesis. Now here is something that's omitted. Genesis 9 and 6 does not talk about death penalty. That's the word we use. Listen how Genesis 9 and 6 deals with it. He who shed man's blood must have his blood shed by man for as much as he is in the image of God. My friend, murder, murder attacks the creator. You are taking a life that God gave without God's authority to do so. You have taken over the creator's place. You have made that person now in your image. It is the, it is the theological base that makes that issue so important. Not the sociological base. Although that's very, very significant, but it's something bigger than that. It's God. God is put in the midst there. That's why God himself sets up the process. This man who you, whose life you took is in my image. That's my property. That's my creation. Only I could do that. Because you took over me, I am now ruling that other men take yours in my name by my authority. Oh, I wish, I wish it could be. It's, it's really simple, you know. 
Now, it doesn't deal with the process, how the blood is shed. It doesn't say whether you shoot them with a bullet, use an arrow. It doesn't say whether you drown them. The, 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 the process isn't... No, no, don't laugh, don't laugh. The process isn't given. The principle is. The principle is given. Whether they will use gas by inhalation or by injection. I mean, that's, that's not the issue. But yes, I'm not making that the issue now. Oh, it is inhumane for someone to shake for two minutes in the chair. Friends, don't laugh. This is what's going on. PhDs, leaders of law, this is what they're reasoning. It's too inhumane. That, see that poor man shake for two minutes, but he's just killed a life. He might have terrorized that young world for hours. The case I read this morning of the girl who was 18 years old. Three men raped that girl and turned around and pumped nine bullets in her body. They are free! Now this is, as you can tell, this is burdening me now. Tremendously so. We can't be content in a social setting where there are tricks to justice. It's on the books. The translation is clear. The interpretation seems clear too, but well, inhumane, and what's the other one? Cruel. Well, that's objective to some people. That's subjective. Um, inhumane. All right. Okay. You go to a man's store. Poor man left home this morning to do his business. He's an honest man. Works hard as he could. Opens his shop. Opens his shop. Pays his taxes. He's a good citizen comes in his shop and you come in as a customer and he graciously opens it for you and you pull out a gun and you say hand me all your money and he says no no I'm not it's mine what I said hand me your money no Brrr. can can anything more be more inhumane and the man doesn't know why he's dying. He's in his proper place. He's breaking no law. He's working hard for a living like a good citizen. Even worse than that, when it comes to the women and the abuse of them and then the murder. Well, can anything be more inhumane? I mean... God wants justice. Amos says so. God is upset with injustice. God is distressed by people who are weak and who give in when they should stand. In every instance, juries must also be truthful. And can't listen to, well, we know the family. That can't be good enough for justice. Amen. Doing what's right will build a nation. Doing the things that please. Let's stand and sing together in our response to God with a clear.
clear word that's been given today. Pastor Rex has been used of God to deliver a powerful word, to help us in our thoughts and our thinking, and to help us to know that we must see ourselves as being called to action. The scripture that we read today from Amos 5 gives a powerful thought that I want you to catch, if I could just add to what Pastor Rex has done today. In verse 10, it says, there are those who hate the one who upholds justice in court and detest the one who tells the truth. I am the kind of person, my gift is I love righteousness, I hate lawlessness, and I, I believe that you just need to convince people that they just need, maybe they just don't understand, if you explain it a little better, they'll do right. But my very own scripture that I believe in is against me, no. No, no, you're mistaken. They don't love righteousness. They, they, they hate, they hate righteousness. They hate the law. They love lawlessness. There are councils of wicked who stay up late at night trying to think how can they subvert justice. Pastor Rex has helped us understand. There are lawyers who will use the system endlessly because they want the money train to continue. And whether a murderer gets out is, is fine with them because they have made money on it. Brothers and sisters, listen. The answer to society is not to educate people better. That's not what's going to stop the crime problem. Crime is an issue of the heart. Our business as a church is to see that people's hearts and lives are converted. But beyond that, we stand up for righteousness. We stand up for justice. We, we oppose the wicked. We, we pray down and stand against the ungodly. I was one of those who was praying that the hurricane would hit. But no, don't laugh, don't laugh. Because my prayer was that God would cleanse the land of its filth. Those who heard me pray, heard me pray this. Lord, mark the righteous and preserve them. But mark the wicked and wash them away. You see, friends, I believe there becomes a, there's a satiation point from which a nation almost can't stand. We have wicked court system. Justice is broken down in the country. We have lawyers who perpetrate and because of the money train flowing will keep the things that Pastor Rex has said going. Friends, please. Let us ask God how we can be better used. But let us stand up against. You see, several years ago, several pastors, myself included, tried to tell the politicians, try to say to them, please, what do you believe? What do you stand for? Let's know that so we'll know how to vote. Not party specific, but person specific. Because it's men of character, women of character, who will stand up and oppose. Not people who buy the party line. Oh, would to God that we would understand it's not parties that's going to save this country. It's men and women of principle, whatever party they're in. Amen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. L let's commit ourselves to being the change that we want to see take place. Let's commit ourselves to where, listening to the Lord and saying, Lord, where would you have me to stand against? wickedness where it rears its head. If you're a lawyer, perhaps there's something you can do to move, a, move ahead laws that say the bail act got to change. We as citizens who are voting need to put pressure on those who are going to be looking for us in a couple of months, perhaps a better part of a, a year, to say vote for me. Where do you stand on the bail act? Where do you stand with murderers getting out? 
free. Where do you stand on the Privy Council? You see, folks, there are tangible ways that we can come against these things. Don't, don't, let, don't let me hear any of you saying, well, you know, I F and M and I could die F and M. I PLP, I could die PLP. I, I for the new DNA. No, 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 friends. No, no, no. Where do they stand on these issues? That's bigger than party. That's the, they're the real issues. Stop the party foolishness, the silly season. Let's go for those who will, who will put forth righteousness and godliness. And that's not party specific. So let's not buy into the nonsense. Let's be Christians who vote issues of character and integrity, who, who are behind people who are behind those things. Shall we pray? Father, we've been singing, doing what's right will build our nation, doing the things that pleases God the most. Oh, Father, there are words that will fall to the ground, empty and vain, if we as the people of God don't understand that we, first of all, must be people who hew to righteousness and truth even in our very homes first. For, Lord, we can't complain what's happening out there if in our own homes lawlessness and godliness are the coin of the realm. Lord, help us to make an impact, first of all, in our homes. And then, uh, where we find ourselves, if we are lawyers in the court system, if we uh, have an ear with the judge, that we would speak to them. But Father, all of us are voting citizens. Help us to pinpoint and, and put pressure on those who say that they want to lead our country, that they would do the things that are godly and right. Oh God, work on us. A sermon like this, Lord, will be forgotten by the end of a meal. But we ask, Lord, that you would so etch the truth, that you would put the, the, the Amos and the other prophets of the Lord so indelibly on our hearts and in our beings that we would become people who strive for righteousness and justice, who fight against uh, the, the, the Balak as it presently stands, who, who will demand that we free ourselves from the tyranny of the Privy Council that says that we can't even execute those who we deem guilty of being executed because they have taken life cruelly and unjustly. Oh, Father, help us first of all to understand that we cannot reason with the ungodly. We cannot correct the ungodly with fine-sounding arguments or even the statement of truth. But, Father, help us by the removing of the wicked from our midst. Remove them, Lord. In whatever way you see fit, remove them, Lord, that righteousness can rear its head again. Lord, the Scripture says, when evil prevails, the wise hold their tongue. Lord, we're in a situation in our country where the wise are being quiet because they recognize that their voice and their life and their families are at stake to speak out against injustice. And so we ask, Lord, that you would move where only you can. Even as we take our various stances, help us to be a people who will make a change in our nation that once again the world would mark the manner of our bearing and see that we are a Christ-loving, God-fearing nation that believes that righteousness ought to be the hallmark of our land, that godliness ought to be the mark of our people, and that evil and wrongdoing will find no niche, no place to infest and to infect our nation with ungodliness. We commit ourselves to these things. We ask that your spirit would make us to be a courageous people again, no longer apathetic, no longer sitting aside as evil reigns, but a righteous people that pushes back evil and demands that righteousness be the hallmark of our people. We pray these things asking your benediction and your blessing on us as we would endeavor to do so in Christ's name. Amen and amen. The Lord be with you. Our service is over, but your service to the Lord continues. Go and serve the Lord. Am I correct in that there is refreshments for the guests? Can someone speak to me in that regard? Do we have, yes? We want to invite our guests to join us upstairs for moments of light refreshments. We've prepared uh, some small refreshments for you and would appreciate you joining us for moments of refreshments. Thank you. The Lord be with you. Go and serve the Lord. Pastor Rex is reminding me that he's got the pears in the back. He would love 
to make sure that your home is secured with some nice, delicious pears for you and your family to enjoy around your meal table today. Please don't forget, right around the back here, DeWitt Wallace will aid you in getting your bag of pears.